creating impact is all about getting that wow factor um, in the photograph. And there are a variety of ways you can do that. You can do it on location, you can do it with composition, black and white photography. So we're gonna share all of this with our audience. Now, if you are joining us for the first time, um, this Creating Impact workshop that we put together is expanded version of what you're gonna to hear today. All right, so today you're gonna to use your 15 minute sessions from each of the presenters. If you wanna join us, make sure you join our workshop because that is where all the meat is gonna be presented. There are gonna be two uh, things to know about the workshop. The workshop is gonna be held right after Thanksgiving. We also have a discount code, which I think I'm gonna have somebody put it in the chat box. It's VW25. You get discount for signing up for any four classes or more. So uh, if you are wanting to sign up, use that discount code. We do have seating, which is limited, just like this webinar seating is limited. It's not 500, we usually top it off at about 100 participants, so it's more manageable for us. So if you guys wanna sign up, it's, it's a great opportunity to do that. So use the discount code and then we can get started. All right, so what are you gonna talk about today? Um, we are gonna talk about these things, okay? So this is the order. So we're in the introduction phase right now. And after the introduction phase, um, we're gonna talk about some, how I create impact with composition, with exposure, with building a photo on the subject. And then it's followed by rest of the panel, Ian, Padma, Alan, Ugo, Joseph, Austin, and Kate. And then um, we'll take Q&A if anybody has it. Also feel free to use the chat box for Q&A sessions, all right? I won't be able to, so if I'm presenting, I won't be able to answer your questions. I will look at the chat box afterwards and try to answer your questions afterwards, all right? So, all right, so let me get started. I only have 15 minutes and I've already wasted a bunch um, already, like four minutes for an introduction. So I only have 10 minutes. So let's go and present what I have to do. So, all right. So I'm going to be talking about creating visual impact with your photos, right? So this is a pretty famous location in New Zealand, Wanaka Tree. And this is a photo that Marina took. And she was really looking to create an impact with the tree and we got really good conditions. So let me ask you guys a question. Um, if I were to talk about visual impact, what is visual impact? The way I see visual impact is visual impact is the wow factor, like I said before, right? It makes your photo stand out. The thing about visual impact and whether you're creating it with post-processing or whether you're creating in camera is it's really easy to know when a photo is really good, but it's really difficult to characterize what is impact. Right? If I were to tell you, is, is it due to composition? It's due to exposure? Or is it due to location, light? It's really hard to characterize it. And it also some ways depends on your viewer. So if you really like nature, I think you muted yourself, Jay. All right, can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. So uh, if you like nature photography, you, um, you will enjoy photos like that. If you're in portrait, you may not really like it. So it really depends upon the viewers. Um, our audience is mostly nature and travel photographers. So we're gonna talk about creating impact with nature photography, all right? So, all right, so let me show you guys the next photo. When I talk about this photo and I'm gonna look at my chat box, I'm What do you guys think is wrong with this photo? All right, what well, is some of the things that people say, well, how can I improve this photo? Let's take a look at a different way. Anybody, what do you guys think? Uh, people who are participants who are joining us, what do you guys think about this, right? Too much dead space, good, good job. And, and what exactly is the dead space, right? Flat lighting, sky needs help, that's right balance, total range, that's right. What's a picture of, that's right. What's the subject in this photo? So there's a lot of things wrong with the photo. Um, one of the things that people, a lot of things people point out is, hey, horizon is placed right at the center, right? So 
let's say we try to improve this photo. So I'm going to say that in order to improve this photo, I want to place horizon third of the center. But now like, take a look at this photo. The, the horizon is, is like exactly in the center. Now, when I show the photo, this photo, everybody was like, wow, this is really cool. Even though the horizon is placed at the center, right? But the photo has drama, it has mood, it has sky. So let's go back to our original photo and say, all right, let me put the horizon at the third, right? I place the horizon at third. The photo still doesn't have that impact, right? So why is it that improving composition alone doesn't create impact? Well, the, the thing that about impact is there's no one factor that is used to create visual impact, correct? So if I were to look at this photo and how the photo is composed, you notice that the rule of the thirds, the horizon is placed close to the rule of the thirds, right? But there's still a lot of dead space. So when we were doing this, uh, this is, uh, by the way, if people are wondering, this is New Zealand. Um, so we were in New Zealand and we were creating a video tutorial live in the field with the, our film crew and everybody. So we were here and we had climbed up on this ridge. Now, the thing that drew our attention is the colors and the soft lighting and the snow-capped mountains. So what Marina did was she took this photo and converted it into something like this. This is a full frame camera shot with creating impact. Now, look at all the textures and all the drama that is filling the same sky, the same lighting. All she did was she brought that ridge that she was trying to focus on and filled her frame with it. So this is what creating impact is. In this case, she created an impact with two things. She changed the lens and she changed the composition. Now people say, okay, so is creating impact all about composition? Well, not really. So let's take a look at this photo. All right. This is Bahia Honda in um, Florida. Uh, people go there, it's a beautiful location. So let's ask another question to everybody. What's wrong with this photo? All right, let's see what people have to say. Anybody? What's wrong with this photo? Exposure is too long, horizon is off. That's right, water is dirty, tilted horizon lacks dimension. What's the real subject? Great. So when I am at a location like this, um, what I want to do highlight is the colors in the water, right? So I love this color, it's, uh, turquoise colors in the water. And I was trying to create depth by using the rocks, but then see these little dark patches that are here? These are seaweeds that are floating in. So if I were to create an impact on location like photo like this, I can't change the sky. Sure, I mean, Photoshop has a new sky replacement tool, but it's not what I was after. I really wanted to create impact using location and using the lighting I have, right? That is a skill that we're gonna talk about. So what I did was I shifted my camera slightly. So this red highlights in the rocks were noticeable and I changed one setting on the camera exposure. Right. So I changed the shutter speed. So what happens when I change the shutter speed? Remember those dark CVs that were floating around? They move back and forth. And so what happens is the color that is static in the water gets intense. So the intense water color show up. And anything that is moving will be averaged out. So the dark CVs are now very much muted. So creating impact on location in this case involve changing shutter speed more than changing uh, composition, okay? So let's see how much time I have. I have about three minutes, so let me wrap this up. So how do we look at creative impact? So when we think about visual impact, we think about it in terms of three different things, right? We think about it in terms of technical skills, which are like using uh, shutter speed or bracketing or things. Then we think about it in terms of compositional elements, which is the textures and the mood and the light. And then we think about it in terms of creativity. So 
when you're trying to create impact, you need to combine these three elements together. All right. So let me give you a um, really brief example of what compositional elements are. And our class visual impact is going to be based on two things. We're going to talk about these compositional elements. Now, these compositional elements sometimes can be helpful to your subject, or sometimes it can not be helpful to your subject, right? So this photo that you see from Iceland, right? In this case, clearly weather and seasons were really helpful to my subject over here. The photo you saw in New Zealand, uh, too much of seasonal colors, which is create a dead space, all right? So these compositional elements, they show up around your subject in negative space. And if you don't use them correctly, they end up creating dead space. If you use them correctly, they end up creating negative space, which complements your subject, right? So in this case, the light is a compositional element that complemented my subject, which is obviously this church, the flowers are another compositional elements, patterns, contrast, um, all of these. And how we manage this is what this, my class on 27th is about, all right? So um, again, what we do is we use compositional elements to build a photo around our subject. So here's an Iceland, a geyser from Iceland, and I use a bunch of different compositional elements. I used uh, the light and the mood. I positioned myself so that the steam was filling all of my background as much as possible um, so that the ropes are obscure to create the photo. And then I had to bracket because I needed technical skills to take a photo like that and then blend it together to end up creating a subject, right? So this is what we are going to talk about in my class. We are going to talk about how do you build a photo to create visual impact? And this is going beyond the rules. It's, it's going beyond just bracketing or it's going beyond compositional rules or it's just going beyond hyperfocal distance. We're going to talk about how all of these three things, creativity, technical elements, and composition interact with one another, and how you capture mood, drama, visualize, and execute. Now, people who have been to our classes, we record our classes in the field. So you'll be seeing us working from multiple camera angles. So here's Raina taking a photo. You'll also be able to see inside our camera. And we'll be talking while we're showing you all this. So there'll be people talking like Marina or me, and you'll be able to see this. And then you'll be able to see what final results we can produce. So we are gonna take you guys live to Iceland, to Utah, to New Zealand, and see how this is done in, um, in the field. All right, so I'll, Take a couple of minutes of Q&A, and then I am going to turn it over to the next presenter, which is Ian, Ian Plant. Um, none of this is going to be done in drone. So my class does not involve drone photography, although we have done drone photography. We have chartered helicopters. Um, we're going to actually talk a lot more in detail about um, a workflow to build photo around your subject that includes creativity, that includes bracketing, hyperfocal distance, focus, and how all of these interact with one another, composition. All right. Any other questions for me? Um, and if you guys have questions, you can put it in the, in the chat box and I'll try to answer in the chat. In the meantime, um, yes. Yeah, so um, I did forget to mention for everybody who's here, recording of this webinar will be available to be viewed later. If you do sign up for the class and you cannot make it because of Thanksgiving or because you're busy or you're working, um, you will be able to view the recording of all our online classes for workshop a year after the workshop is done. All right. All right. So um, one thing that I do want to ask everybody before I introduce Ian is what is the largest single most expensive thing a landscape or nature photographer has in his camera bag, in his um, non-camera bag. What is the largest travel expenses? Stop giving away answers to everybody, Joseph. <laughs> but it is correct their imagination. Actually, travel expenses are the largest component of our photography, right? So when you're at 
on location, you want to maximize your time. And I'm going to turn it over to a fantastic photographer, Ian, and say, Ian, you take it away. How do you maximize right. your time on location? Okay, well, I'm going to talk about maximizing your time on location. And also, I'm going to try to maximize my time since I've very clearly got very little of it. And I want to apologize to everyone ahead of time. I've never actually done one of these webinars with Jay before, and Jay forgot that I've never done one. So I had no idea what we were doing today. So I don't really have a formal presentation, which is great because you get my unfiltered thoughts, you know, because my filtered thoughts are so good to begin with. Uh, the unfiltered ones are even better. So strap in, folks. I do have a bunch of random photographs that I'm going to share while I'm talking. Uh, none of them illustrate any of the particular points, but for those of you who are not familiar with my photographs, then uh, it'll at least give you an idea of the kind of shooting that I do. But what I'm going to be talking about in the uh, paid event that we're doing at the end of the month is how to maximize your creativity and your output when you're shooting landscape photos in the field. And I'm going to talk about my process for making evocative, effective, and meaningful landscape compositions. And when I'm with clients in the field running workshops, everyone wants to know, like, you know, we, we, people like Jay and myself and everyone else, we talk a lot about compositional theory and working with light, this and that. But, but people are always saying, well, Ian, you know, I, I really want to know what, what's your process? How do you approach making a photo when you're in the field? And this is something I do on my workshops. I take my clients with me on these little scouting adventures where we go to a spot that I've never photographed before. And I walk them through the process of finding landscape features that I think are gonna make good photographs. And then kind of narrowing in my focus to figure out a way to take that interesting feature and make a compelling landscape composition out of it. So basically that's what the presentation I'll be giving at the end of the month is gonna do, is gonna go from the start to the, the finish the process of starting at a landscape location, exploring that location, figuring out what might potentially be good, figuring out how to optimize that photo, and then getting all the technical stuff done and then triggering the shutter and making the shot. So it, it really is going to be a very clear sort of step-by-step -step process. I, I loosely call it a five-step process. It's really maybe more of a six or a seven-step process, but it's five main steps and a few sub-steps. And I'm gonna walk through those steps briefly today. And if you wanna learn more, then you should check us out at the end of the month for the, uh, the paid classroom event. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, and just show some random photos while uh, I'm talking. So hold on one second, here we go. And Okay, can everyone still hear me and see my photos? All right, well, I'm gonna just dive right in then. Uh, so as I said, these photos aren't necessarily key to anything that I'm talking about. But you know, the key thing is when you're making landscape photos, you can't just expect to show up at a landscape location and make good photos. There's a real process involved that you need to follow from start to finish so that when you do trigger the shutter, you are maximizing your ability to get something that is gonna really be impactful and connect with viewers. And so the process starts with research. Whenever I go photograph a landscape location, I always start off by learning as much as I can about the area. One thing I avoid doing if I can is looking too much at the photographs of other uh, big time professional or serious amateur photographers, because once you start seeing other really good shots from an area, you just want to go take those shots yourself. I mean, that's just human nature. You see something cool, you want to possess it yourself. So I want to get an idea of what the area might look like, but I don't want to pollute my own artistic vision. So I typically start off with something like a Google images search or something like that, because, you know, usually you're not getting full on professional photos. Uh, when you search on Google, you get a lot of tourist shots. And the tourist shots are great because they give me a really good idea. Sorry, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm thinking I'm having some technical difficulties here. Bear with me for a moment. My computer's frozen. Am I still connected? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, my yeah, computer. Yeah, we can still see your screen, so. Um, yeah, 
I can't un I can't stop the screen sharing though, and my my computer won't advance. Sorry guys, this has never happened to me before. Um, all right, well I'm just going to talk, and uh, maybe Jay, you can unhook my screen sharing or something on your end. Okay. All right. So try it again if you want. Let me try it again. That was weird. Um, all right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to really move through. So, I, you know, I like, um, I like looking at the photos that maybe casual tourists have taken so I can get a sense for what the area looks like. And then I start pouring over maps. I like looking at satellite views. So I get this kind of top down look of what the landscape might look like. And then I start planning a few general locations that I think are going to be promising. And then when I get there, it's all boots on the ground. Then the real process of finding what is going to work starts, and that is the process of scouting. And this is a key component to any landscape photography workflow. You have to get out there and explore. I start off by exploring as much as I can in my vehicle. Then I get out on foot. And that's when you really start identifying the interesting compositions. Uh, and the process for identifying interesting compositions, I basically break that down into two components. So the first component, uh, this is... Okay, I'm going to stop. Yeah, well, we can let we can just leave it on the screen. I don't know what is going on with my computer, but it will not advance my slides. So I'm just going to talk. Uh, so the this this is just really embarrassing right now. Don't worry, that's all right. <laughs> Go ahead, you can stop it, and I'll just that way people can see me at least and get a laugh at at the expression on my face. Um, so where was I? So I break it down into a two step process, and the first step is identifying the point of interest, identifying what is going to be in the background of your landscape photo. And this is uh, kind of the most intuitive part, because I think that, you know, when you're out there in the landscape, you kind of know what you want to photograph. You might be down in Patagonia and you know that Mount Fitzroy is going to be your background subject. That's your point of interest in the background. Other times it's not quite as intuitive. A lot of other times you have to go out there and explore the landscape and find that interesting point of interest. But once you've identified your point of interest, the next step is finding a compelling foreground that will lead the eye to that point of interest. Because if you're just, if you're just zooming in and photographing that interesting landscape feature, you can make good photos that way. But if you wanna make really strong, compelling landscape photos, you need to find that compelling foreground to juxtapose with that background to create this near far visual tension that gets the viewer's eye moving back and forth. So in many respects, I think that the foreground is the most important thing in your landscape photo, which is counterintuitive. But that scenery, that beautiful scenery that you showed up to photograph, you need to get into the mindset where you push that scenery into the background of your composition and focus on that compelling foreground that is going to lead the viewer's eye to that background, but create a more interesting composition. And these two steps, people ask me all the time, well, which do you first? Do you find the background first and then look for your foreground? Or do you find your foreground first and then look for that point of interest in the background? And uh, the answer is both. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Sometimes you'll have that point of interest, you know what you want to photograph. And so the process is just finding that good foreground, but sometimes you'll be out exploring and scouting and you'll find a really interesting foreground and you'll say to yourself, yeah, I really want to photograph this. Now I just got to figure out what my point of interest in the background is going to be. And often that point of interest in the background will be a landscape feature. So I'm looking for something to put in the background that will attract the viewer's eye. And when I call it a point of interest, I'm often looking literally for something that comes to a single point. And that's something I'll talk about in my uh, presentation at the end of the month in greater detail why that is. But having that point in the background creates this narrowing of perspective, creating these vanishing point lines, these converging implied lines that will draw the viewer deeper into the scene. And so with that in mind, your point of interest in the background doesn't always have to be a landscape feature. So if you find a really interesting foreground, uh, sometimes you can work with a point of interest in the background that is something that's not actually a landscape feature. It could be a cloud that drifts into the scene. It could be the sun setting in the background, having that starburst effect of the sun in the sky with a wide angle lens. That could be an effective point of interest in your background. So uh, 
you know, I'll talk about point of interest being step two and foreground being step three, but you can reverse these two. And once you've identified your compositions, once you've gotten the compositions that you want, the next step in the process is figuring out what the light is going to be like, what the light is going to be that's most effective for that shot. So there's a process of planning uh, where the light's going to be at sunrise and sunset, figuring out which light works best for your chosen composition. And usually what I do when I'm in the field is I'll actually find several compositions that are relatively close to each other. I'll have like composition A, composition B, composition C, you know, I'll have my first tier compositions and then my fallback compositions. And the reason why I try to develop multiple compositions is that there is going to be some unpredictability with the light and the weather. And so it's a good idea to have compositions that face different ways that are all relatively close. So if your favorite composition isn't working for whatever reason, the clouds aren't right, uh, and it's just not working with that composition, you can pivot and go to composition B or C and hopefully that'll work better. So having multiple compositions that are pre-scouted and ready to go is a great way to ensure that when the moment arrives and you've got the optimal light and weather for your composition, you can nail the shot. And then the final step in the process is, is the weather. And weather is key to landscape photography. Not only will weather influence the quality of the light, but one of the key things to landscape photography is having a compelling sky. So you're going to want to have really cool clouds with great shapes and hopefully catching some color at sunrise or sunset or twilight so that the sky isn't just blank. So you have interesting compositional shapes and colors in the sky that might complement the shapes and colors in your foreground and in the scenery down below. So uh, you're, you're scouting, uh, finding that point of interest. Uh, finding that foreground to work with that point of interest, identifying multiple compositions that are ready to go, uh, figuring out what the light is going to be, and then learning how to identify those moments when the weather is going to be optimal. Those are the key five steps on the creative side of making compelling landscape photos. And then you also have two steps on the technical side, which is making sure you get the exposure right and balancing your exposure. Cause often you're photographing landscapes on a, you know, like with at sunrise or sunset when there's a really bright, colorful sky, but the landscape might be in shadow down below. So you have to balance that exposure to get it right. And then you also need to make sure you achieve that deep focus effect so that everything within the landscape scene appears to be in sharp focus. So these are all things that I'll be talking about in more detail later on this month during the Creating Impact uh, class hosted by Visual Wilderness. So I hope to see you guys there. Thank you very much and sorry for the technical problems. So uh, thanks Ian. I actually put Ian's uh, class link in the chat. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask in the chat for Ian and uh, we'll monitor that. Um, if you're going to sign up, you can actually sign up on Ian's class uh, using the link below. All right, so um, let's talk about the next uh, presenter. So we're in the middle of pandemic, as everybody knows, and travel is iffy at best. So what do we do? Um, so one of the things you can do is to be able to create impact at home. And there are a couple of presenters we have over here that are phenomenally good at that. And we'll start with Deepa. And if you actually look at Deepa's work today, you'll never look Padma. at a flower. Padma. Padma. Not Deepa. I can change my, my name for you. <laughs> my sister's name is Deepa. So I was like, OK, Padma. If you look at Padma's work today, you'll never look at the flowers in the same way. Thank you. Padma, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so I just want to give like a two minute introduction about why I do what I do. And then I'm going to take you into Lightroom just to show you the examples. I won't be able to go for a demo today only because it takes a little longer for that. So I am a full-time IT professional and I'm stuck at home for seven months. Even before that, travel was kind of uh, iffy because when you're working full-time, you get like two, three, four weeks max. Otherwise you have to uh, take a break from work and I cannot afford to do that with you know, you know kids in college. Um, so my goal was to, how do I create impact 
meaning how do I make myself um, unique from other people by using the same images because I do teach some uh, flower photography. So that means I have to be better than my students, right? So I keep um, trying to invent like new ways to uh, come up with creative um, techniques in uh, post-processing. I, I do have, um, you, know, a real, you know, a few specialties, but I, how do I take out ordinary images and then turn them into something, say, wow, right? I'm going to share my screen real quick. Now, for, for example, I'm going to go here, and if you see, I've taken this um, ranunculus. If you look at that, this is done in 2017. This was at a nursery, and I used a black velvet cloth, and I, I have a little arrangement with the nursery owner so that she lets me come in over the weekends and make a little studio in the back of the greenhouse. And I shot this. And why did I have so much room is uh, because I try to um, increase the canvas space in Photoshop, because if I want to do something creative, I need a lot of space around the um, subject, and that's why. So my next image, when I was playing with it is, okay, why, where did I get this idea from is um, two things. One, in India, in springtime, we celebrate a festival called Holi, where we, um, you know, spray colored water onto people, spray colored powders onto people, and um, just wear white clothes and then just go get dirty and uh, be colorful and enjoy uh, later on, enjoy some like, you know, just like Christmas, like exchange presents and eat, drink, whatever. Um, so I miss that terribly here. And I don't think I have played holy here in the last 30 years. <laughs> uh, so that's one. And two, there was um, uh, a show that I really uh, like to watch. It's called Good Fight. And the intro to that, if you can actually go to YouTube and then say intro to Good Fight, and you see these objects exploding, like they have like different um, objects exploding, made that into an intro. So I got an idea from there. And then I saw one YouTube artist coming up with this action. And I said, okay, you know, instead of me figuring out how to do that action, I would just go ask him. And he said, um, I sell this action in the marketplace. So I went and uh, bought the action. And then I started buying more actions from different artists. And uh, so I tried to create this one. So what I do at home after work to unwind is to have like a big pot of herbal tea that I, I make. And then I put a lot of music and then I start playing with various ways to, you know, change my already existing images or I set up a black um, a cloth at home and then I go buy some flowers and then bring them home. And then I, um, you know, set them up and then I create whatever I create. So you you can imagine my kitchen. Uh, I don't use it for cooking. All I do is either photograph, paint, or I do exercise uh, while watching other people teaching uh, photo photography. Okay, so this is another one. I've done this, um, uh, take this image on the roadside. My friend Al was holding the diffuser in the back of uh, the flower, and then I started taking shots. I have about 10, 15 variations of these compositions of the same poppy. Then I like this better because I kind of like the uh, the back of it, the lines uh, going through. So then I said, okay, I can fix this in Photoshop by cleaning out the um, blemishes and all, but what else can I do? So by using uh, Alien Skin software, I went into um, bokeh filters. I'm going to explain this in my upcoming um this particular example, I'm going to go through all five variations and how I did it. So anyway, I wanted to give that uh, feel of dancing flower in the wind, except I did not do it in the field. That's my before picture. And I tried to do that in Photoshop only because um, sometimes when you're in the field, you have like three, four minutes to shoot. You might not think about all the ways that you want to uh, compose. But then good thing about close up photography, especially with flowers is there are various ways to uh, experiment in Photoshop, Lightroom, various plugins. So this is one of those um, things. Now, if I uh, go here, I took the same image and then I inverted colors in uh, LAB workspace. And then again, I try to do that dancing flower thing. Um, so it inverted the colors, it gave some kind of ultraviolet kind of look to it. And then I took the, the second image that I showed you into texture effects. Topaz uh, has this uh, uh, plugin called texture effects. 
by the way, I do not use Topaz Studio only because it's another software to learn, but this is just a plugin from my um, Photoshop. And then I have a bunch of textures that I bought from various people like French Kiss, Jay Johnson, and I experimented again. I experimented quite a bit with the textures. I did that and I said, it's, it's a little plain, so let me work with other textures. And so I tried to um, add a different color scheme into it. So this is more um, staying with the same color scheme, whereas I tried to play up the, the blues and the pinks, or I tried to add more colors to my image. So again, you, you can take the same image and then play with various plugins that you have, various textures that you have. White background works uh, with adding more textures only because um, you can overlay, you can change the blend modes, and uh, you can get the desired effects. And uh, sometimes my mind goes into this hyper mode where I come up with like 10, 12 variations in Photoshop and I decide uh, which one I like better. And then every day I like one and the next day, depending on my mood, I like the other one better. So I, I do have some hard time deciding which one I like better. So then let's see, okay. So then I said, okay, let me work on this to like, how can I make it explode, right? Um, so I spent about four or five hours on this and I created this. Believe me, I try to recreate this about seven times now or eight times. Every single time I get a different, different kind of uh, result. For example, I just tried this morning just to give an example of what it can be. Um, so let me show you all my... So this is one and then so I, I try to create the action. It's not the same as before, but it's, it's, you know, slightly different, not exactly. But then what I will do is I spend a lot more time uh, going through individual layers. If you look at all these layers that created on the um, right side, there are about 60 layers it has created. So I'm going to go through each and every layer and see what impact it created. And then I'm going to see if I can, you know, use the curves to bring up the colors a little bit more, maybe increase the brightness a little bit. So it takes a lot of time and I am right in front of the computer for my work and also for processing. But this is immensely satisfying. So I'm going to take one example of the same flower that I'm showing you. I'm going to go through how do how did I come with all these uh, five versions of it? So this is another version that I've created. Again, you think that there is not much of a difference. There is slight slight difference. Um, it depends on how you mask it and all that. So I'm going to go through all that. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take more. But I'm going to show you one more example, or maybe two more examples. So again, this is a rose that I have done in well, Portland, Oregon, some time ago. This is good image by itself, I think, because it shows all the nice, you know, curves and the petals and everything. But then I said, okay, how can I make it better? How can I create this visual impact and then lure the audience into the image? So I kind of reduced the saturation on this and I applied a texture on top of this. And I, I think that this is cleaner and I think it is more impactful compared to the original. You do have to have a good image to uh, from camera to start with. It's not like, okay, you can take a blurry image or you can take a noisy image and then try to improve it. So you have to uh, concentrate on your composition in camera, how you uh, take an image. But you also should be able to play with it. That means you need to bring an open mind and you have to be in that mood to create new stuff. And if you are like me, like an impatient person, I have like so much impatience for other things, but not for photography. So by God's grace, I think that I'm, I'm lucky that I can spend hours and hours without getting bored. And the next one I can show you, these are a bunch of leaves. I was just playing with these hostel leaves. Um, those are in my in my garden. And I um, these were actually green. What I try to do is bring them in, put them in water, leave them be for like a week. And then they are turning color because they're not seeing the sunlight and all that. And then I took them and then lay them out on a black cloth and then um, took an image. And then that's what I tried to do, disintegrate. Um, so I changed the um, orientation a little bit and then I worked on this image. So again, um, 
how can I make an ordinary image into something that people ask, oh, how did you do that? I want to elicit that uh, reaction from my viewers. The last example is, so if you look at that, this is a very ordinary image. There's nothing special about it. I shot this on a light box. And then I applied a texture and then I tried to play up the backlight by giving a little bit more light in uh, Lightroom. And then I added a texture in Texture FX Pro, uh, Topaz Labs. And then I said, okay, I developed my own uh, little uh, technique. When I say I developed my own, I actually took the uh, idea from somebody else, an architectural photographer, applied it into flowers. And then I found another filter in Nick that would help me to get to where I'm at. Um, that's the silver effects, all right? And then I said, okay, um, this is good, but what else can I do with it? Is that the same black and white? Oops, I thought I had one more, but let me see. Anyway, I played with the different versions of black and white, but that's the one that I like the most. And this is my very recent one I shot like a couple of days ago. Uh, I put a little glitter garland in the background and I tried to shoot this. But the next one, if you see, I tried to add alien skin filters to this and tried to make it more airy. And I dedicated this to my favorite um, latest woman, Kamala Harris. And I thought that, you know, that would, um, this shows her radiant smile. That's, that's my tribute to her. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll take any questions that you have. So there are a bunch of questions and I'm going to let you answer that in the chat box. Sure. Um, and everybody, I did put a link to um, Padma's uh, classes. If you guys really want to know what and how she does this, uh, that's a class that you need to come to. I think she's going to go through, remember if I correct Padma. So here's another link for Padma's class. Is you're going to go through a couple of these effects and see exactly yes. how to do this, right? Yep. So it is going to be, in-depth Photoshop stuff that is just brilliant. Thank you. All right. And you're right. Some of the people say, is this creating impact with photography? No, it's creating impact with post-processing. Um, so let me introduce our next speaker. Uh, so if our next speaker is a master at creating impact in his living room, in his flip-flops, and with a glass of wine in his hand. And, Urban. And if you guys have missed his last workshop about the new color grading tool, you should check out Visual Wilderness page. I'm gonna put Alan's um, link, not only to his online class that is coming up, but also to his page, which has a ton of um, webinars and online classes on Visual Wilderness. So having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alan. Alan, you take it away. Hey everybody, uh, so I shoot and I process for at least an hour every day. For me, it's therapy, it is a creative exercise, it is an emotional release, and one of my favorite things to do is to explore the power of black and white. So I'm gonna start sharing. Um, and we're gonna just get right into it. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. So this has been my re reaction to life every day for the past four years. Um, and so I take solace in photography. I, I find escape in photography. And one of the things that I find I am asking myself all the time is what's next and what's going on and in some cases, it is. Hey, Alan, I just see a white screen. Um, so I don't I, see any images yet on the screen. Really? Yeah. Because I'm seeing images on my screen. Do you guys, everybody see, or I just see a white? Um, How do you the only thing I can see on the bottom is the, uh, the like reel with all yeah. the photos on it, but yeah. I can't see a big photo in the center. Are you the on the center? No. Really? Yeah. Or you need to share the whole screen, not just you have to share the whole screen, not the application. So if you share the uh, whole screen, okay. it'll so work. Let me get out. Yeah. Let me do a new share and share my desktop. How is that? Much better. <laughs> and now you can just like um, do that. Put the okay. 
Lightroom on the entire screen and it should work. Okay, so this is my this is my reaction to, to life these past couple of days, past couple of years. This is also my reaction. So as a, I am primarily a macro photographer that I think is what I'm best known for, but I do a lot of uh, portraiture for folks. I do a lot of food and tabletop work. And I find that exploring the black and white side of the world is absolutely fascinating for all of these things. So I know we may have a lot of nature photographers here, but some of you may do portraits and some of you may in fact, sorry, this is moving a little slower than I would like. Um, and some of you may do animals. I, I was privileged to be invited into the White House bunker a few weeks ago. And this is an actual shot of the, the, the boys lamenting the election. That is a joke for those <laughs> of you who are, whose English is maybe a second language, um, but it makes me laugh every time. Uh, I find there is an incredible amount of texture and form and compositional uh, uh, excitement that comes when I look at things that I've typically shot in color in a black and white medium. So my class is going to show you how to take everything that you've ever shot, bring it into Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. I'm going to do a different class about conversion techniques in Photoshop because it is a slightly, there's a different range of tools. And I'm going to show you everything I know about working and converting things to black and white. Now there's a number of tools that we can use uh, and I'm gonna show you the differences between all of them. And those are conversion tools. What you're now seeing in some of these is what I'll call the creative effect tools. And that's where you can add things like color grading, which is its own separate thing or working in curves or adding grain so that you can take a black and white image and you can make it look even more artistic. So here's an approach where I'm replicating an older film type by adding grain to an image and softening the amount of contrast. Um, let's keep moving. So I'm gonna jump ahead and here is one image. And here's the exact same image converted a different way using different techniques. And again, different techniques. And it all starts with the basic tools. And here's where I'm gonna go and I'm gonna show you a really quick example. So here we are in Photoshop and I've got essentially a color image. I mean, it's, it's not, but you get the idea. It is all the colors within the gradient spectrum. And if I were to go into Photoshop, uh, into Lightroom and simply click and do a basic conversion, you get something that's really awful and it's boring and it's flat and nothing really works well. So we, what I've done is essentially converted it to black and white and opened up what is the black and white slider spectrum. And here's where I can make some very specific decisions based on the eight colors that Lightroom gives me choices to work with it. So I can now control how the yellow is converted separate from the green and separate from the orange. Now they're contiguous colors, so we have to be somewhat careful. But now I can start introducing some creative effects as I have much more control. Where let's go into real life. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna set up an image and I'm gonna go, am I in my develop? And I'm gonna set up a reference photo and I'm gonna use the original as a reference just so you have the idea. And now I'm gonna show you a number of bad and good ways. So some people may think that ah, I could just do a black and white conversion like this. So all I did is I reduced the saturation. Not good, avoid this, please don't do this. So I'm gonna reset that. Other people will start and look, I'm gonna click on the black and white conversion, but that is really kind of bland and basic. 
But what it's done is it's allowed me to go in and Lightroom starts me with a basic mix and you'll see it gives you a nice smooth curve, but the image is very flat. So let's play around with a little bit and watch what happens. So I know there's a lot of red in my image, but I wanna darken that red. Um, and I kinda wanna take the orange down a little bit, maybe just to here. And my yellow, I think I wanna go to here. And with my green, I wanna start going up. And so as we're doing this and as we're experimenting, there's nothing in the aqua, but there's blue. And so now, as you're seeing, I have a lot of very specific control over specific colors. And that gives me the ability to make a conversion much more dramatic, to uh, deliver a lot more contrast in areas that I want. And I can do this so many different ways. Now, from here, I might go into, uh, into a white balance trick. So this is some more specialized stuff. And now that I'm in black and white, you might not think that playing with the white balance would have an effect, but it does. Likewise, I'm gonna reset this. If I go down into camera calibration, which is normally used for correcting lenses, in this case, I'm gonna use it as a creative tool in conjunction with the black and white uh, conversion and I'm gonna show you what's possible. And then lastly, we're going to start experimenting with curve tools and watching what happens when we, when we crush blacks and, and start muting things. And then let's think about maybe some effects. So do we wanna add grain or not? So this is a very quick example of what I will do in my class. And there'll be far more examples in a lot more depth. And what it's going to do is it's going to take our boring winter where we don't know what's going on and where we're likely sitting like this. And at the end of the class, I'm going to have you smiling like a cute little child and knowing that you can do all of these things. And again, I, just a reminder, as you're watching all of these incredible instructors that I'm really privileged to, to be you know, uh, teaching with, it's not about doing what we do. It's learning what we know and creating your own vision. So that's the goal is that we can all fill our winter months, whether we're locked up or whether we're just being hyper cautious during this crazy time to experiment and explore and create our own unique looks. And that's my two cents. And here we go. Cool. I think I have um, put everybody um, everybody the link to Alan's classes in uh, the chat box. I'll do it again. If you guys have any questions to Alan, just let them uh, just put it in the chat box and then we can see how things go. All right. So the next topic is, let's say, uh, let's see, where is my presentation gone? There we go. Um, one of the things that is absolutely critical to know how Alan does things is you want to adjust things locally, right? So you have to adjust things uh, just in a small area. And how do you do that? Well, one of the best ways to do that is using range mask. And Ugo Che is going to talk about how range mask and why range mask forms foundation for a lot of post-processing uh, techniques that we learn about. So Ugo? Go ahead, Thanks, Jay. You are up. Thanks, Jay. Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to, to go back a little, a little bit to more uh, landscape and, and nature images with my presentation. And yeah, you, you said it. So it's going to be about range masks, which are a relatively recent addition to, to Lightroom. I don't remember exactly which version they, they introduced those range masks, but uh, um, I found that they, they allow me much greater freedom and control in, uh, in my ability to, to create impact with my images and especially add impact to those areas of the images where I, I think they need to, to have some extra 
contrast or color or saturation or under the light without uh, impacting the rest of the image and being very precise in, in where can I, I can apply my, my adjustments. So let me uh, share my screen. I've got some, some slides here with, uh, uh, with some uh, examples. And um, of course, I'm going to, to show some, some examples here, but well, during my class, uh, um, my full class, you will be able to, to see examples of, of this processing from, from start to finish and see them on, uh, on a variety of landscape images uh, taken using different techniques. So some of them will be just one single images. I will show you how to uh, apply this to HDR type photos where they have a lot more information, but all, they also have some, some more Let's say they entail more risks because it's easy for with HDR to, to really go overboard um, or do things like in, in panoramas where, for example, when you're shooting panoramas, you include a lot of things in your, in your images. And even if you're not doing a stitched panorama, but in landscapes, we normally, we normally, we often use wide angle lenses and they tend to include a lot of stuff in our landscapes. And those things have varying degrees, those areas of the image have very de varying degrees of luminosity, of color, contrast, and so on. And we want to be able to control those specific areas with, with a lot of, uh, uh, without a lot of effort, but with a lot of control, with a lot of precision. So um, basically what, what I want to do when I, when I go out and take a photo and I see a beautiful scene like this one, this one was shot in the in the Dolomites in Italy uh, about one year ago, when we could, could still travel there. <laughs> and this this photo is is very flat, and uh, the light there was was not this flat. I mean, the light was really good, but of course, this is just a raw photo straight out of camera. And as if everybody who shoots raw format knows, uh, the raw format that you take out of the camera without any processing, any anything it will look rather flat and boring and lacking contrast, lacking texture and everything. So what I want to do with, with a photo like this is to go through, through this final effect, right? So much more impactful since we are talking about uh, impact. But in order to go here, I mean, before having range masks, it was pretty difficult with Lightroom. Uh, you are pretty much limited to global adjustments. And with global adjustments, you can get something that is close to that, but it's it's not there yet. So this is the first step. I take the image in my Lightroom uh, from, the, from the memory card, and then I apply global, uh, I, I fix the, I use the black slider to set the black point. I set the, the white slider to fix my highlights, highlights, shadows. Uh, contrast, saturation, I might add an S-curve and so on. And I might come up with, with such a result. But there are some issues with this first version and let me uh, quickly go over them. Like for example, these guys, uh, they were very lively in my, in my rec recollection of the image. Uh, this version here, they are a bit muddy, those clouds are gray, they're not really brilliant. The, the blue in the sky doesn't really show through. So that's one issue. Second issue, that mountain range was quite far away. This was shot with a medium telephoto lens. So the mountain range is quite far away. And due to atmospheric haze, what happens is that uh, you get a bluish cast on objects that are far away. So um, that's a problem I want to fix. But if I warm up everything, also the sky, the clouds in the sky will become a little bit yellowish. Uh, another little problem here, the trees at the bottom were, what really attracted me to this scene to this scene was not just the mountains that were amazing, but also the fact that uh, the sun, this was late afternoon, I had sun to my right, and it was hitting those trees from the side and the trees were really glowing to, to my eye. And I don't see that glow uh, anymore in, uh, in this version here. So I need, I have basically three separate zones in my in my photograph that I want to process differently. I want to apply different in processes, different in processing uh, instructions to each one of those areas separately and uh, distinctly. So 
with Lightroom, previous versions, you could do, you could think of, okay, I want to fix the sky and I want to use a graduated uh, neutral density filter. And so to apply some effects to the sky, like increase the contract, make it cooler. But if I do so, as you can see from this screenshot, you apply a graduated filter. And you, if you want to include the sky, you end up including the mountains to at least the tops of the mountains that have those jagged edges that is not, I mean, the graduated filter has a linear uh, edge and it does not follow the uh, top of the mountains. So uh, that would not really work well. So what you want to do, maybe you can use Photoshop and try to, to use layers and layer masks to create selections, but it's a kind of a time consuming uh, process. So maybe you don't even know how to use Photoshop, you want to stay in Lightroom. So thanks to um, Lightroom range masks, you can still apply a gradient filter, but mask out areas where you want the effect to gradient filter to not apply or apply a little less than the rest of the image. So in this version here, my gradient filter does not impact the mountains as much as the sky. It is mainly limited to the sky. You can see the pink here, the pink, does not represent the final processing. It represent it highlights where the filter applies and where it doesn't, right? So, uh, and so in the end, you end up with something that, to my eyes, looks much more natural because those mountains now have a natural color. I remember those, especially in the late afternoon, the mountains they don't look blue to your eyes, but the camera picks up the color of the atmosphere, which is bluish. So you don't want that, right? But still you want the sky to be a bit more blue. And you want uh, the trees in the back to be more glowing. And especially one issue with the trees was that some of the, the those yellow trees are larches. They turn yellow in the fall, but some of the pines in the uh, there do not turn yellow in the fall. They are much darker green and the blacks, the, the shadows there were crushed, completely black. They didn't look right. So I wanted to apply some uh, opening up the shadows, but only in that area of the image. So this is what I, I did with uh, with gradient filters and range mask combined with gradient filters to limit my processing to those areas. Uh, another few examples here. Uh, EM plan previously was mentioning the fact that we in landscape images to create impact, we want to have something in the foreground that is uh, create this uh, relationship between foreground and background. This is another scene that I took in Scotland. And compared to the previous situation where it was a, a nice fall day, this was a fall day, but it was raining. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, moisture in the in the air and everything was quite flat. The light was flat because the, the sky was completely overcast. So still a beautiful scene. I wanted to photograph it and uh, give it, present it in the best light possible. So again, first version uh, is definitely an improvement, but still not quite satisfying. Why? Because for example, those clouds up there, they too dark, they, I call them leaden. They look a bit like lead. Uh, the, the distant mountains again are washed out because of the atmospheric haze was creating, uh, um, making them, I mean, there was a lot of haze there. So uh, there was no texture or contrast in the distant mountains and the light on the, on the immediate foreground was a bit flat. Um, so again, using uh, gradient filters with range masks, I was able to apply different processing to different areas of the image with a lot of control. So I got more contrast in the foreground, uh, controlling the whites so that the water there was not as blown out, controlling the, um, uh, increasing the texture in the mountains, giving a little bit of blue tint to the clouds so they're not so oppressive as they, they were. Uh, another example here, I don't know why I have those blue lines in my presentation. I don't know if it's coming from Zoom. Somebody's drawing on my screen, I think. But anyway, just ignore those little blue squiggles there. I don't know where they're coming from. Um, 
And what, what's the problem with this? This is a stitched panorama. It's, I think it was seven different photos stitched together to create this photo. And I was using a polarizer and it was probably a mistake. I didn't realize that using a polarizer, what happens sometimes is that the polarization effect changes um, depending on the angle that you of the, your camera with respect to the sun, the direction of the sun. So shooting a wide panorama, uh, I wish when you're shooting 90 degrees to the direction of the sun, you get a lot of polarization, you increase the blues, they get very deep and intense. And when you're shooting towards or opposite the direction of the sun, uh, this effect is much less pronounced. And here I was paying attention to the sky. You don't see that effect a lot in the sky, but still, for whatever reason, because also the polarizer is impacting the way the light reflects off water surfaces, I see that the, the blue in the in the water there is too intense. It's it doesn't match what's in the sky, right? So I want to turn the blues down, but I don't want to do it everywhere, right? I only want to do that in that specific area. So what I did here, I used the radial filter because it fits very well with it covers the this uh, small lake in Scotland again. And then I applied a luminance mask to make sure that my adjustments were only applied to dark parts of that filter. So they were not impacting the clouds and only impacting the two dark blue reflection of the sky in the water. And the final effect was more of a natural than, than the previous one. So, um, one more uh, uh, example here, another photo from the Dolomites. Here I was really uh, taken, amazed by this amazing sunset with those lights. I wanted the, the, the mountain group in the, in the center of the, of the image and creating those compositions where the, the clouds seem to come out from, from that mountain. But I also wanted to include a little bit of the, 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 the forest in the foreground just to give a, a point of where the, the eye can rest while scanning this image top to bottom maybe and then stopping there and not going out of the picture. But because of the contrast, because of the light in the scene, it was after sunset. So there was not a lot of the light in the ground. The problem is that those trees are very, very dark and they're lacking detail. So again, fixed with a graduated filter. This time I didn't use a luminance mask. I used the color mask so I could apply my adjustment only to the greens in this case and leave alone the browns of the mountains or the pinks of the sky. Uh, and this was the final result where I get more detail, more natural uh, brightness in those areas there. So uh, final example, very quickly, this is a bit more subtle. This is a starting image with global adjustments. I wanted to get more uh, contrast and texture in the area uh, where the castle is and the mountain behind the castle without impacting, uh, for example, the little uh, puffs of fog that were there on the right. And if I added too much contrast and darken it too much, I would lose some of those. So again, this is the final result. And for this, I used, uh, again, a gradient filter. I used the color mask to exclude the blues uh, only applied to these greens and yellows. And I also used the brush to paint out from the filter those areas with the fog because I didn't want that to change. It was good enough for me at that stage. So these are just some examples and you will be able to, to see them start to finish during my class inside Lightroom, all the steps that you need to take to get this, this result. But just to summarize uh, what I said so far, um, so why use range mask? Why do I use range mask? Because when I shoot landscape images, especially with a wide angle, I can have many areas with varying degrees of luminosity and contrast. And I want to control the processing there. And those areas do not have regular shapes. And with Lightroom, you get a gradient filter, you get a radial filter, but these have regular shape. It's either a rectangle or an oval. You don't have a, much of a choice there, but nature does not have those shapes, not always. So you need more control there. But you can also use brushes, but gradient and radial filter are much quicker to use than brushes, which take a lot of painting and controlling the fine edges and so on. Uh, so before range mask, we didn't have precise control over those selections. And now with range masks, we can. So those range masks give us a number of benefits 
right? Uh, so refine and selection, which we can do with Photoshop, but we can do it with Lightroom in a very fast, especially intuitive way because they are based on luminance and colors and everybody understands uh, luminance and colors. So they allow you to, to apply your adjustments to a range. This is why the call range mask because you apply those adjustments to a range of luminance values or to a range of colors. Um, so you can apply local adjustments in small irregular shaped areas, bring out details and contrast in HDR images without going too much overboard where those details and contrast are really not needed. And you, sometimes with HDR, uh, it's easy to create images that have too much contrast, they're too crunchy, too, uh, too much detail and uh, texture. And you can do all of this without Photoshop. So if that's really not your, your game, but another thing is that once you want to go into Photoshop, if you learn to use range masks properly in Lightroom, then you will learn techniques that also apply to Photoshop. Uh, I mean, at least the general concepts, even though the details of how you apply those are a little bit different. So what's the key takeaway from this presentation and the key takeaway that I think you will get from my class if you desire, if you want to join it, it's that you can create wow photos by adding impact, of course, but only adding impact where it is required and not creating something that maybe is too garish or uh, doesn't look natural. I still want my photos to be impactful, but still look natural and realistic. So uh, that's, that's my presentation. All right. Um, I think I'll let people ask questions to Hugo. Um, I did put a link to Hugo's class. So if you guys want to sign up, go ahead. Now, um, there are other ways to create impact, which especially localized impact like Google was showing, right? Range mask is superbly useful, but you can go beyond range mask to create impact. And that is what Joseph is going to show us using advanced dodging and burning techniques. And this will be like, a whole new level of local adjustments, I hope, Joseph. So Hello. you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, thanks for everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, Joseph Ross back here. I'm going to be giving you guys a brief presentation uh, this morning on um, dodging and burning. And we will be doing that um, while we're talking about doing that through Photoshop using luminosity masks. Um, so I am sort of a traditionalist uh, photographer. I do primarily landscape work. Um, and for me, it's all about going from the capture to the print. I print everything um, that I shoot. So I'll just give you guys an example here. Uh, this is a print uh, that I made uh, just, the, uh, just last night. So I do a lot of artist proof prints until the stuff is ready. Um, and my workflow is relatively simple in, in Lightroom. I start off in Lightroom and then I will finish off in Photoshop. Now in Lightroom, um, just like what Ugo is talking about, I do do some, um, what I would call selective or local adjustments with um, tools like the radio filter and the um, gradual filter, just to get everything sort of balanced out. Um, and then finally the image will go into Photoshop for some much more advanced dodging and burning and painting with color to create those beautiful tonal and color relationships that I want in my image. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and go through a keynote presentation with you guys on what you can expect um, to get out of dodging and burning, some of the techniques that are used and what you will see in my upcoming class through Visual Wilderness. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen and there we go. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's Let right. jump into keynote and bring it up. So, <clears throat> yes, today we will be talking about dodging and burning. Now, dodging and burning is not a new uh, technique to photography. In fact, it's been around for a very, very long time. Um, just a little background about my um, journey um, as a landscape photographer is um, I started out um, shooting film. Um, and I shot film professionally for many, many years, uh, large format film. But before I got into doing color landscape work, um, I did many, many years of black and white photography and working in a wet dark room. Um, and then studying a lot of the techniques of the masters like Ansel Adams and 
uh, Minor White and fellas like that um, with their darkroom work and doing a lot of dodging and burning in the wet darkroom. And what I've done is I've sort of moved that concept and that workflow over into my uh, digital process. So this is probably one of uh, Ansel Adams' most famous photographs, uh, Moonrise over Hernandez. Um, and one of the quotes I really like uh, from uh, Ansel Adams is, dodging and burning are steps to take care of mistakes. God made an establishment in tonal relationships. So you have to think of the raw file as a negative. And in fact, the raw file is essentially a digital negative. Now you can see on the image on the left of Adam's photograph, that is what is called a contact print. And then the image on the right is his finished image um, with a lot of the dodging and burning that he did in the wet darkroom. And you can see how that image has much, much more impact and it has that sort of wow factor that we're looking for in our images. So this is a shot of Ansel Adams uh, on the top in his wet darkroom uh, towards the end of his days as he was doing a lot of printing of his images. Um, and then there's a shot below of what it would actually look like to do dodging and burning um, the traditional way in a wet darkroom through projecting the image um, onto paper and then using certain tools uh, that you use with your hand to either reduce the amount of exposure or light through the projector on the paper or to increase it to darken certain areas to create that tonal relationship in the photograph or in, in essentially in the final print. So one thing you can think about is the negative or in our situation nowadays with digital photography, the raw file is the composer score and the print is the final performance. So. It is incredibly important to get things as close to being perfectly right um, as you can when you're in the field shooting, as far as you know, having a very compelling and wow factor composition, um, getting the exposure correct, and uh, nailing your focus, if that's what you're looking for. A lot of times with our traditional landscape photography, <clears throat> pardon me, we wanna make sure that the image is sharp from front to back all the way through the image for printing, so that's very important. But that is only one half of the process of digital photography nowadays. Because when you get that raw file back onto your computer, it is going to lack the impact and the drama that you were experiencing when you were shooting that image in the field. So I'm going to teach you how you can take that to the next level. So here is the finished image that has been done in Photoshop with just luminosity masks and dodging and burning, basically lightening and darkening regions of the photograph to create those tonal relationships that work in the photograph and create that drama and wow factor from the image. I will also teach you in class how to create a digital contact sheet. I do this for all of the photographs that I process. Um, it, it allows me to map out the regions of the photograph that I want to change, okay? So like I said earlier, uh, I do a lot of basic adjustments in Lightroom as far as setting the profile of the image, um, the white balance, some very basic tonal work with highlight and shadow adjustments, uh, digital raw sharpening, and then adding a little bit of global saturation to the shot. And everything else is done um, with selective or targeted adjustments. So you can see in this image here, I've drawn out regions of the photograph that I want to make changes to. So for example, I want to make that sky darker and more richer in color. I also wanna darken the cliffs that are coming down on the right-hand side of the image that have the light from sunset shining on them. Uh, I wanna create a sort of a glow effect coming in from where the sun is setting out on the left-hand side of the image. And then looking down at the mid-ground and the foreground of the shot, there is a pool of water with reflections down there. I'm going to increase the exposure and the brightness values in that pool of water to make that stand out. And then of course, with that really compelling foreground, uh, because it's in the shade, it's lacking some, uh, some texture and some contrast and some overall drama. Of course, the foreground is essential to the image being successful. So I'm going to do some work down there. 
And then what you'll see in the end is an image that looks like this, okay? So we've went from this digital negative that we've worked out the areas of the image, the regions of the photograph that we wanna make changes to. And then we're gonna to get to this in the end. And I'm gonna show you my workflow and how to do that. Now, um, here's another example of a shot that I took actually just a week ago down in the swamps of Louisiana. And this is with very minor adjustments in Lightroom as far as white balance is concerned and some global adjustments for shadow and highlight control. Um, and the image is good, but it does lack that sort of impact that I wanted to create in the final photograph. And this is what it's gonna look like using luminosity masks and selective darkening and lightening adjustments in Photoshop. So you can see that it has much, much more depth to it. Uh, I've allowed the tree that is the subject of the image and really is the only thing that's in focus in the shot of, sh of shooting this image handheld with a telephoto lens from a kayak um, to really stand out on the stage of the image. So what I've done is I've brought that out and I've reduced the background and I've reduced some of the, uh, the darker tones in the background and in the water, increased the brightness uh, values in the foliage on the tree and in the reflections to create this much more dramatic and impactful image. So what we'll be working in is what I call the digital darkroom. And we'll be doing that out of Photoshop. Um, at the beginning, we'll work on one image basically um, throughout this class and we'll take it all the way through from start to finish. So I will start off doing some very minor um, adjustments to the raw file to um, balance out the tonality as much as I possibly can in the raw converter. And then from there, we're going to move into Photoshop and we'll talk almost specifically about using luminosity masks in conjunction with layers and brushes for creating that drama in the image through selective darkening and selective brightening. And I'll also talk to you guys in class about how you can use these luminosity masks to dodge and burn with color as well. So <clears throat> for example, if you take a look over at the TK7 rapid mask, and I'll just, I'll advance one more slide for a moment. This is what the rapid mask looks like that we're gonna be working with. Uh, by the way, this is something that if you take the class, you're probably going to want to download uh, for Photoshop. And um, I will give everyone the information on where they can get it. It's really rather inexpensive, costs uh, about 30 bucks to get this panel for working inside of Photoshop. So it's extremely inexpensive. And I think that it is going to demystify and speed up your workflow in Photoshop for creating these custom masks. But this is the panel that we'll be working out of. And you can think of it as like a black and white zone system. So we're going to be able to um, create very custom masks based on the tonal um, values in an image. So for instance, if you look at this particular shot, uh, it's showing up in black and white because it's showing you the luminosity mask that I would be working with on this image if I wanted to only adjust the brighter values of the photograph. So the way that luminosity masks work in Photoshop is when you apply a mask to an adjustment, white is going to reveal the adjustment and black is going to conceal or hide the adjustment. So this allows me to use this very simple panel to click through lights and darks and midtones and even color selections like red, green, blue, cyan, and magenta to make these custom selections on the image and then to apply adjustments to those. So for example, once I've identified the luminosity mask that I want to work with, I can go down and make any type of an adjustment I want to those values in the image. So very basic adjustments like curves and levels, brightness and contrast, hue saturation, or I can get a little bit more advanced and go in and work on doing dodging and burning, clarity adjustments, painting with color, um, and the Orton effect, okay, using this beautiful panel. And so that's going to allow me, once I've selected what I want to do, so for example, on an image like this, I may think that those bright values in the snow on the mountain and the brightest parts of the clouds are a little too bright, and I just want to bring them down a little bit, okay? So once I've dialed that in, I will have a very custom 
layer adjustment with that mask associated with it. And then I can pretend like I'm an artist or a painter and I can use either my tablet or my mouse to selectively basically paint in a darkening area that is only um, going to be applied to those brightest values in the image. And so I can step through the process of creating this greater depth, impact and visual flow in my final presentation of the photograph with these very, very simple and very basically techniques that have been around since the beginning of time with photography. So here's another example. This is a aerial photograph of Badlands in Southern Utah. And this is just with some very minor um, Lightroom adjustments, okay? A bit of a crop, changing the profile of the image, playing around with the white balance, doing a little bit of highlight and shadow recovery, and then adding a little bit of saturation to the shot. And then of course, some sharpening as well in the detail tab in Lightroom. Now the image has gotten better from where it was coming right out of the camera, but it still is lacking the drama that I want in a photograph like this. So this is the result after working in Photoshop with just doing dodging and burning on different tonal values throughout the image, and then doing um, a little bit of painting with color to the photograph for some of the highlights. So what we will cover in the class. First of all, you need to understand what luminosity masks are. So that's the first thing that we will dig into is how luminosity masks work and how they can become a very integral part of your workflow without being overwhelmingly difficult to master. And that panel that I work with is going to allow you to work with luminosity masks in a way that it makes a lot of sense and is very user, user friendly. All right, I will also show you guys how I create a contact sheet and I map out in my mind how I want the final image to look and how I make notes on the image in Lightroom for dodging and burning and adding contrast and color to certain areas of the photograph. And then we're going to talk specifically about how to dodge and burn, how it works, when to apply it, how to apply it with examples of how it's going to change the image and create that greater tonal balance and depth and drama in your photograph. We'll also talk about dodging and burning with color, because this is also something very important to doing color landscape work is adding color depth uh, to relationships in the image. And you can use dodging and burning with color to do that as well. Um, and then I will finally finish it off with um, creating custom vignetting inside of Photoshop, which is a little bit more advanced than using the effects tab in Lightroom for creating a soft vignette for your image, which is very important for the final presentation of the shot, especially in printing. Um, so uh, like I said, this is gonna be sort of a deep dive and we're gonna go from raw to, to master file to print ready in this uh, class that I'll be teaching. Um, you can see a little bit, if you're not familiar with my work, if you're a first timer for me, if you take a look at my website, josephrossback.com, you'll get a pretty good idea of the kind of work that I produce. But just very quickly, before I jump back into the share, I wanted to just jump into Photoshop for um, just a couple minutes. And I've loaded up an image here, and I want to give folks an idea of exactly how this panel works and what we'll be doing with it and what you can expect to see from the class. So for example, this is an image that has been um, do, you know, processed just a little bit inside of Lightroom, talking about some of those things that I was speaking about before just minutes ago. Now, I want to show you guys what we can do with it and how these luminosity masks work. And I'll show you one particular thing on this shot. Let's look at the brightest values in this photograph, OK? Let's identify where the brightest values in the photograph are. So if I come up here to my rapid mask panel, and I come down to where the masks are, you'll see on the right hand side of this, there's lights masks. And on the left hand side, there's darks masks. And then there's mid-tone masks through here, which are only three of those, okay? But let's say I wanted to just bring down the brightness values of the very brightest portion of the photograph, all right? If I click on mask number one, it's going to give me a black and white visual representation on the image of what that mask is going to work with. As I click down through here and I go to number two, what you're gonna notice is 
the mask is getting more contrasty and it's getting darker because it's eliminating um, the selection to just the brighter portions of the photograph. And as we go further down, that will continue until we get all the way down to just the very brightest uh, tonal values in the shot. Now, once I've identified the tonal values that I want to work with, and by the way, we'll also talk about modifying these masks, okay, so we can increase the masks contrast or levels on them to get a finer, more accurate control over the areas that we want to affect in the image. But once we've made this selection of what the mask should look like, we can very simply now go here to where our adjustments are and do any type of an adjustment we want. And it will only be targeted to these values, these tonal values in the image. So if I wanted to darken them, I could click on burn, okay? And once I click on that, it's automatically gonna give me um, an adjustment layer over here for burning that is associated with that mask that I just selected. It also automatically brings up my brush tool and it changes my color selection from white to black because I'm going to be burning or darkening. So I'm gonna be painting with black to darken these tonal values. So now when I start to click, I can begin to darken that portion of the image. And what you'll notice is, is if I pass over any area that isn't selected with that mask, it is not darkening that region of the photograph, that tonal region of the photograph. It's only darkening the areas that this mask is associated with, okay? So just these areas that are coming out in white. So it allows me to very specifically go through the image and, 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 and tone the image exactly how I want it. Um, and then going through a process of different light masks and different dark masks will allow me to finish off the image almost perfectly uh, for printing. Uh, one of the other things that we'll talk about in class is making color selections. So instead of just working with the luminosity selection, I can work with color selection. So if I only wanted to say, uh, make an adjustment to the brightest reds in a photograph, I can click on that and it's going to select the areas that have those color tones of red in the image, okay? And then I can apply from there a mask to it. So if I only want to adjust the brightest reds, I can click now on my lights mask and you'll notice that as I click on this, this one tree that was very red over here is the only thing that is now selected, which means that I can now come in here and make an adjustment to that. Let's say I wanted to brighten that up with dodging. And as I paint over that, it's only gonna brighten that red tree over here on the far left of the photograph. And I'll zoom in just to give you guys a quick look on that. It's these adjustments are very subtle. So as I click on this layer on and off, you'll notice how that tree has just gotten a little bit brighter with dodging out that red tone based on the color selection and the luminosity mask. So in closing, I think what you'll find that you're gonna get out of this presentation is a very advanced way to create visual impact in your photographs. Now, like I said before, you have to start off with a really good photograph, something that is evocative, great composition, great light. And I'm gonna show you how to take it from good to great in this class with some very simple adjustments with dodging and burning. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to uh, the general class section. Thank you. Well, if you guys have any questions about Joseph, um, let me know. I have, this is like Joseph's third class with Visual Wilderness. I have to say that the way he explains stuff is by far absolutely fantastic. I have known a lot of good photographers and a lot of good photographers, but Joseph is a lot of good photographer but a phenomenal teacher. So his explanations, just like you saw the last three, are super simple, easy to understand, and something you can actually do it yourself, right? So I put in a link to Joseph's class. If you guys want to sign up, please do so. Um, remember, VW25 is a discount code. I will send out this presentation to everybody after this, all right? So um, the next up is Austin. So let me ask you guys a question. Like how many people have traveled and getting all those great colors in the sky is very nice, but then you get to the location and the colors just don't show up. In fact, the clouds don't show up. 
I, my last trip to Utah in creating impact class that I was there, there were absolutely no clouds for seven days that we were there. We were in the middle of a drought, right? So what do you do? Well, to show you what can be done is Austin Jackson. Sweet. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, let me share my screen here and see. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Austin Jackson. I'm a landscape photographer from uh, originally from the Pacific Northwest and I'm living in Utah. Um, and so I'm teaching the creating impact with night photography course. Uh, so first of all, I just want to talk about uh, why night photography. Um, the first thing Jay kind of stole my line there um, is that it doesn't require amazing light. So I'm sure a lot of you guys, you've been on a trip with a spouse, with your kids, with your parents, whoever it is, um, <clears throat> and they want to go in the middle of the summer and the clouds just aren't there for you, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of photographers feel kind of shut down. They feel defeated. They're, they're really frustrated because they see all these great photos, um, but they can't get them because the light just isn't there. And so that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love night photography, because if there's a shot that I want, all I have to do is look for clear skies. And I know that I'm going to go get that shot. It's, it's uh, a lot more predictable. And the second thing is that everything happens really slowly at night. So you may notice for a sunrise or sunset, you're going to be out there um, and the light's going to be changing so fast and you're going to be running all around and trying to figure out um, exactly what composition you want. At night, things move so much slower. The rotation of the earth is slow. So the Milky Way is moving very slowly in the sky. You have plenty of time to sit, sit out there, relax, um, and, and line up your shot. So that's another reason I like night photography. Um, also, you're going to impress all of your family and friends. Trust me. Um, night photography is, is very impressive because it's not something that you can, you can capture it a lot better on the camera than you can see it with your eye. So your friends and family are going to be impressed. Christmas is coming up. Um, I, if you want to get new camera gear, uh, you're going to need to impress your friends and family to convince them why they should let you get the new camera, the new lens or whatever it is. Um, and lastly, clear skies are super easy to predict, like I mentioned before. So night photography is really easy to capture because, um, as I'm sure a lot of you landscape photographers out there know, it's it's a lot easier to predict clear skies than it is to predict great light. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a few challenges at night, though, that we're going to need to overcome. These are going to be things I'm all going to talk about how to get around in my class. First of all, it's dark, obviously. Uh, a lot of people don't think about this. So you have to kind of understand how to operate your camera in the dark. You need a headlamp, you need warm clothes, whatever it may be. Um, that's one of the main challenges that we deal with at night. So you really got to kind of know your stuff in and out. Um, and for to do night photography. Um, it's not as simple as daytime photography. We can't just walk out there and point and shoot and take a photo. Um, night photography is a little bit more invested, but it's not too hard to learn. It's just that it is more invested once you're in the field. Um, we're going to need to learn how to manually focus in the dark. I'm going to teach you some really great techniques for this in my class. Um, unfortunately, we can't use autofocus and manual focus is much harder because uh, everything in your viewfinders is going to appear pretty much completely black if you're out there shooting the Milky Way or the night sky. <clears throat> um, and then we also need to create low noise photos because um, for those of you that have shot at night before, you probably know that the photos will come out really noisy. You've got to shoot at a high ISO in order to kind of maintain that brightness of the foreground. Um, and so I'm going to show you guys some tips to, to create really low noise photos. So I'm also going to teach you guys how to prepare for the shoot um, as well as the proper gear. <clears throat> you do need certain gear for this kind of photography. Uh, for example, a tripod, a wide angle lens, um, a camera, wh whatever you need. Uh, I'm going to talk you through all that as well as the other items you may want in your bag. A lot of things that I bring when I'm out shooting night photos, um, I'll bring a laser pointer. Um, I'll talk a little bit about star trackers. Um, I mean, there's a ton of different gears, headlamp, jacket, you know, all that good stuff. I'm going to talk you through all of that give you a little checklist for everything you need. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about predicting the right weather. There's a few websites that I use as well as a uh, many apps that I use to predict the right weather for night photography. As I mentioned before, we want clear skies. This is much easier to predict than those cloudy skies, but I am going to still talk you through the different ways that I predict the weather. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ideal settings to use in the field. So I know a lot of you may have tried night photography before, um, but a lot of you have not. I'm going to kind of give you guys a little cheat sheet so that you know exactly um, the settings that you want to use in the field uh, when you're shooting. Um, and of course, this is going to change for every composition and 
and seen, but um, there is kind of a rough settings that you want to go for in every, every uh, night photo that you take. So I'm going to tell you guys all of those. And um, uh, lastly, I'm going to show you processing. This is going to be what a majority of the class is dedicated to, is processing photos. So here is a raw file um, and then brought all the way to edit. I've got kind of on the center of the screen there all my layers, and that looks like a lot right now. I'm going to talk you through all that. I'll flip back and forth so you can see the before and after again. Um, so I'm going to walk you guys through exactly all the processing steps that you need to take to create great night photography. Um, so some of those processing steps, uh, one of the major ones is dodging and burning. This is the photo before dodging and burning, and this is after. So really just helping to bring out the Milky Way, make it pop. Um, we're going to talk about color toning. You can see that this photo here is kind of yellow and bland and boring. Uh, I added a little bit of a blue tone here. We'll just flip back and forth for before and after. Always very satisfying to do a little before and after. Um, <clears throat> and then I'm going to show you guys how to build a custom vignette. Um, one thing about building a totally custom vignette rather than using the slider is that we can actually create a brightness in the middle. So if you see, I'm flipping back and forth here. Um, on this custom vignette, I've actually brightened the middle and darkened the edges rather than a traditional vignette, which just darkens the edges. Also going to show you some noise reduction techniques. Um, there is some really good ways to reduce noise, and there are some really bad ways. I'm going to show you guys the ways that you want to use. You can see on the left um, that the photo is quite a bit more noisy than on the right, which is after using one of my noise reduction techniques. I'm also going to show you guys some other night photography techniques. So um, a lot of you folks in the Northern Hemisphere, like myself, uh, you may know that the Milky Way is gone for the season until March. Um, but I am going to show you some other techniques, such as star trails like this image here. Um, and I will show you some blue hour techniques. We'll talk about those a little bit at the end of my course at the end of the month um, so that you will be able to use those techniques in the winter. Or for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, I know that the Milky Way is just coming around. So good time of year for that. Um, so lastly, I just want to talk about uh, one more time the benefits of coming to my class at the end of the month. Um, first is that I'm going to show you guys how to shoot night photos in the field. So whether you have never done it before, you've never done it successfully, or you just want to refine your techniques, I'm going to show you guys um, all my process in the field, what I bring, uh, what I need to do, and the settings I'm aiming for. I'm also going to show you all my post-processing tricks for night photography. So I'll be doing a few small images where I'll do a little edits at the beginning of the course, but towards the end of the course, I'm actually going to do a full walkthrough on an image. Um, and so you can see that. And because you can actually view the course uh, for a year after the course happens, you'll be able to go back and watch that later when you have a night photo and you can edit your photo alongside the recording, which is so, so helpful. And I highly recommend that. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, it's, I'm going to show you how to create images for your portfolio on clear sky days. Super frustrating uh, when you go on a week-long trip and you get clear skies every day. Uh, but I want to make sure that you guys get portfolio images um, on those clear sky days. And so you're going to learn how to create night photos. You're going to expand your portfolio. Um, it's going to be great. Super excited. So that's really all I have. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there is any. Um, but yeah. Great, uh, great presentation, Austin. I am... Uh... I think this is an exciting class um, because we all had to deal with clear sky days. Um, so I think I have put Austin's uh, link in there. I'm actually going to send out this presentation to everybody. If you guys do sign up for more than one class, make sure you use uh, VW25. Uh, it'll give you 25% off uh, for four or more classes. Okay. All right. So last uh, presentation today is from Kate Sylvia. Um, you know, we always get these images in our camera that we're like, eh, they're fine, they're not that great. But then if you look at things a little bit differently, post-processing using um, some great techniques can bring out um, some of the images that look ordinary to extraordinary land, just like Deepa showed us, right? So Kate shows us how she does that with our landscape photography. So Kate, uh, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Jay. Let's share my screen here. You guys see that? Yep. Excellent. All right. Um, just wanted to talk about using some of those creative effects. I. Um, 
I'm kind of like a, a, a kid in a candy store when it comes to uh, using uh, software, but you can be creative in camera. I mean, that's where it all starts. We start in the camera and we can shoot through things when we're in the field, uh, shooting through your foreground objects and looking for new angles and, and things like that. You can use longer shutter speeds and an actual camera movement to create impact. Uh, this is especially fun on windy days uh, if you're a macro photographer and you're struggling with wind ruining your scene for you. You know what, just go with the flow and do something a little bit different. Uh, we can create impact with long exposures. This is one of the traditional types of things that we think of with long exposures using about a quarter of a second to a half a second for waterfalls. And, and then we can do something a little bit different, a little bit more special with some ND filters in the field. And we can even use specialty lenses. Um, you know, that's a little bit more expensive for your creativity, but it definitely works. It was with a fisheye. I think it looks like planet Earth. So that's the type of stuff that we can do out in the field, but it really doesn't end there. There's all sorts of things that you can do on the computer when you get back home to enhance your images. And some of them are very traditional, like high dynamic range blending, panoramas, focus blending. Uh, and then some of them get a little bit more interesting, adding textures, creating bokeh. So let's see what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Uh, high dynamic range, HDR is when we take something dark and something bright and, and we put them together to create something different and unique and has all the tonal range that we want, everything that we can see with our eye when we're out in the field. The camera is simply not capable at this point of seeing everything that we can see. Uh, give it another uh, you know, five to 10 years and I'm sure it'll be able to see more than we can see because technology is just blowing me away these days. Panoramas, uh, it's just a different way of looking at the same old subject. Because sometimes you see something and you go, you know what, I just, I want the whole thing. I'm greedy that way, what can I say? And uh, you want it end to end. And that's something that can be done in Lightroom now and Photoshop and the other layered software, you can do that to create something a little bit different. Same type of thing here. This is actually a combination of the two different techniques that I just talked about. It's an HDR pano, and it doesn't look like a pano. It's square format here, but I was using a wide angle lens and I kind of ended up having to crop it a little bit, but I was at this scene and I wanted that near to far feeling. And I also, if I kind of focused just on the mountains in the background and the sky, that was really neat. But I loved the flowers in the foreground as well uh, this time of year up on the Blue Ridge Mountains. So, I, you know, again, greedy. I just wanted everything. Uh, so I ended up doing a pano and HDR to get all those tones. Focus blending is something that we can do that's a little bit more creative on the computer at home. And so in this situation, I focused one image here and then the next image I focused right here. And the reason why I didn't just, you know, slap it all the way up to F22 is because that would have brought the background itself into too sharp focus for me. It would be end up being distracting and I don't want to do that. And so I have to take these onto the computer, teach them to talk to each other and, uh, and to get along. We all got to play nice together, don't we? Adding textures is something that I do fairly frequently. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to experiment with my images. I'm not afraid to do things that are different and unusual. And I mean, honestly, I think it's, I think it's a lot of fun and it helps me think a little bit differently when I go back out into the field. And so I might even look at things a little bit differently. But, uh, you know, I just didn't like the sky behind uh, these birds. I thought it was a little bit boring. And so I added a little personal touch. Um, I don't know about you, but I love bokeh. And if you are a portrait shooter, macro shooter or something like that, you are probably also a fan of it, but it's not always the easiest thing to get. But uh, there are actual textures 
that you can buy online or you can create them for yourself the next time you do get a lot of bokeh. Uh, just take a nice photo of just the bokeh itself. And I apologize for the hammering. I told my husband just to <laughs> take a break. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but you just teach these images to talk to each other and you create something again, uniquely yours. Do you guys want me to stop that? <laughs> no, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. I apologize for that. Um, if you can hear it and it's bothersome. Um, this is a situation I'm sure a lot of us as landscape photographers have run into is that we are out and taking a picture of something in a reflection. And the lily pads right here, this is up at Cypress Gardens. They, as soon as I started to get the reflection the, you know, the, the lily pads just basically disappeared. I mean, all the green was gone. So what do you do? You put on the polarizer and you give it a turn. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh wait, all the green is popping out now. But what happened to my really cool sky and reflection? And this is one of those situations where, again, I want the best of both worlds, but that's not something that you can necessarily do in camera. So you've got to bring it back on the computer and again, they got to talk to each other and you can get the best of both worlds. That one's a little bit more complicated. Um, I will show you in the class on the 28th how to accomplish something like that. So that that is kind of a, a field technique that you have to remember to take all of the different images, just like HDR, just like Pano, that's kind of planning ahead for what you're going to have to do on the computer later. I like to create painterly effects. Um, I actually like this so much. I started painting a couple years ago uh, and really enjoy it. And it's something that I kind of experiment with from time to time. And sometimes an image is perfectly fine. I think that this is a beautiful scene uh, and I really love it. And again, combining techniques here, this is another pano. But sometimes I just, I don't know, I wanna do something different. Uh, so a little Van Gogh touch with Topaz impression and we've got something a little bit different and it just, it says something different to the viewer. Now, when it comes to doing things in, in Photoshop and in different softwares, here's another example of creating the painterly effect. And this is actually the image that I'm going to use in the class. Again, painterly effect. And this one, I actually applied a canvas a texture within the program to it to actually make it look like it was painted on canvas. Uh, you can add sunlight or rays. Um, this again, little fisheye lens here at Magnolia Plantation. And the sun was just peeking through here. And I did manage to get a little bit of a sun star, but not quite enough. And so I added a little bit extra in uh, Luminar with their rays technique. And here I am at Jekyll Island and in, in Georgia. And I must have sat here for 15, 20 minutes waiting for the clouds <laughs> to clear just long enough for the sun to poke through. And it wasn't happening, uh, you know, so I gave up and I moved on. But, you know, hey, why not do it at home uh, and create something fun for yourself? Replacing a sky. Um, this one, it, it, it gets mixed reactions when you say, well, I'm going to replace the sky. It's, oh, it's fake. It's terrible. And it wasn't, doesn't represent reality. All true. It is fake, not terrible. And no, it doesn't represent reality. But this is my art. This is something that I create for myself. If other people like it, great you know that's wonderful but i do this first and foremost for myself and nobody complains when i do different brush strokes or add clouds or uh, create a reflection in a painting that i'm doing and so i feel like my photographs are exactly the same thing they are my art and i can do what i want with them and so here uh, from my kayak at a place called Bird Key off of Folly Beach, South Carolina. I just <laughs> loved that these birds were all lined up 
uh, perfectly in a row. So I had to get that pano from my kayak, but the sky was terribly boring. And so this was literally a couple of clicks in Luminar and I had a much better image that made me happier. And uh, I think this little guy on the end was agreeing with me. <laughs> um, you can <laughs> change the colors in your image to change the mood. Uh, and this is something that I'm sure you felt a lot while you're looking at Alan's work is that, uh, you know, changing it to a black and white can really make it more stunning. Uh, I find that a lot of my long exposures because of the, I use a Singray 10-stop um, filter for a lot of these and it tends to uh, kind of flatten and dull my images and it really just needs something. And a lot of times, especially these midday shots, it works really, really well in black and white. So I don't want you to be afraid to experiment. And that is what I'm going to be talking about in my uh, workshop coming up next week on the 28th is, is really just kind of letting the reservations go and starting to create things that you appreciate, that make you happy and, and not be afraid to do so. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here and head back to everybody else and see if anybody has any questions for me. All right, so we're all back. Um, we're gonna leave, be here for a few minutes if you guys have any questions, but while you're asking questions, I just wanna remind you that what Padma and Kate have shown over here is artistic effects. Um, the way I look at artistic effects is, hey, I do add artistic effects to, to things that are, um, outside the reality, but I'm pretty honest and ethical when it comes to telling somebody on social media saying, hey, if I added a sky, you just be honest and say, hey, I've added a sky or I've changed something. Oh, so, yes. I do want to say that I am always forthcoming whenever I do something. As a matter of fact, if I, if I take the time to create something really crazy, um, I'll just let, I'll just put it out there that I, you know, and it took me an hour and I'm really proud of the work that I did. And, and, you know, who cares if it looks completely off the wall, it was just something that I created for fun. Um, so I do that a lot and I don't enter any photo contests or anything like that with images that I have done something that extreme with. Yeah. Um, and so you just be ethical as, as much as you can. And I think people will enjoy doing this. And when it comes to selling art prints, you know, uh, not everybody wants to see a photograph. Sometimes these artistic effects sell a lot. I've seen these effects uh, hanging up in hospitals, in uh, lobbies of hotels. And so if you really are interested in making fine art prints, experiment and, and see what you can come up with. And you will never know what people will like. So having said that, um, any questions? Our workshop coming up is right after Thanksgiving. We are offering a Black Friday discount, uh, VW25. I'm gonna put this up again. So anybody who wants to sign up for four more classes, please use that discount code and we'll give you 25% off, all right? So um, let people, anybody want to uh, have any questions, feel free to ask them now uh, for people who are here. Well, I don't see any questions. Uh, I'll wait a minute or so and tell people have a chance to talk. Um, oh, there was a question for Kate. What are the best uh, textures for Boca? Um, I actually downloaded a Boca texture pack. Uh, it was probably five or six years ago. I honestly can't remember exactly where I got it, but it was probably it was either French Kiss textures or uh, two little owls or painted textures because about five, six years ago, those were the primary three that I was getting my textures from. Um, and they just had a, a bokeh texture pack and they were all different colors and, and styles of bokeh. And you can also, and in the video or the um, workshop that I'm doing on the 28th, I'm also going to be going into uh, Topaz software because they actually have a Boca collection in their texture effects, Topaz te texture effects, which is part of Topaz Studio 2. 
uh, and I will be going over how to uh, use those as well. And that just comes with the program, a whole bunch of uh, Boca texture. All right. So I'm going to ask this to Joseph. Joseph, does anybody use Lumi, Lum, Lumenzia, luminosity masking? I don't think I've uh, Lumenzia. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I haven't used it. So I'm not, I'm, I'm aware of it, but I'm not familiar with it. Uh, what I will say is- I use it extensively. And okay. uh, yeah, it's, I think it, it's better than TK panel and Greg Benz is one of the best teachers. Yeah. You, you like it better than the TK panel? Yes, yes. Okay. 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 I, I won't tell. I won't tell Tony don't tell about Tony, that. Tony that. <laughs> <laughs> I have both. Plus, I have Sean Badger's all all videos too. But Greg Benz is really good. <laughs> all right. Um, the other question I had, Deepa, was for you. Was hey, uh, the exploding flower. People wanted to know what uh, what is that effect. I, are you going to share it here, or are you going to wait until people do the class? Right. What is the effect? Um, yeah, what's the plugin you're using for exploding flower? I put it in there in the chat. Um, so right. there are a bunch of actions, but I just don't use the action by itself. There is a sandstorm, there is dispersion, there is explodo, there is atomize. But what I do is I take it and I have a little technical background that I can actually take it into either XML or Notepad and then I I dabble a little bit to customize it to myself. I won't be able to go into all those details how to edit somebody else's actions and record on, on your own, but I will show them how you can use layers and masks using the same actions that you buy them for seven, eight dollars. And um, by turning on and off some of the masks, how you can um, get the effect that you want. So one thing that I do want to address is there was a question saying, can you um, enlist for the class later and get the recording? Um, the, we do not offer um, purchasing of the class once the class is over. So if you want to sign up for the classes, you have to sign up before um, the class starts, right? So before 27th. Once 27th comes off, we will stop signing up the classes. We do not give out recordings for the classes. We will, we do put these classes on, like work, online workshops on every couple of uh, months. So you will get an opportunity to sign up for another workshop. Hopefully a lot of our panelists are repeat, but um, yeah, don't expect that the class recordings will be available for sale. Just letting you guys know, all right. Um, okay, any other questions? I know that a lot of people are stuck st st around and many thanks for attending. Uh, just wanted to chime in real quick. Um, when, it re you know, when it comes to regards to using like different panels and software programs, there are 16 different ways to skin a cat in photo processing. So what's more important is to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. So there are a lot of different avenues to get to the same end of the street, right? So when I'm gonna go over my presentation um, that's coming up, even though I use the TK7 panel, all of the techniques that I'll be covering can be used in any of the different luminosity panels that are available out there. And there are many available nowadays in fact, new ones pop up every week. So it's very difficult to keep up with everything yeah. coming out. And I'm kind of like, you know, uh, I stick with what works for me. And I, I just, you know, that's what I work with most of the time. So. Yeah, and the same thing I wanted to mention Joseph's uh, point is when you see our classes, we teach using Canon and Sony cameras. Now, when you look at the back of our cameras and you see Canon and Sony, doesn't mean you can't use the same camera settings or same focus techniques on other cameras. Um, all the exposure on cameras work similarly. So your buttons may be different and you, you're, the way you select the exposure may be different, but essentially the results will come out the same. So it's important to learn the technique and then use the panel that you like um, and use those techniques. So understand that and you'll get a lot more out of our online workshops, all right? One thing to add about the uh, luminosity panels is that um, the TK panel they have the the basic panel is free, um, and so if you're oh, not right. if you're not totally sold on luminosity masks, get the free panel. Uh, it doesn't allow you to do color masks, but it does allow you to just do regular luminosity, and that's usually um, what I will use just because it's easy to use and there's not so many features. So it's a good way to learn before you end up buying the real panel. And all you have to do is give your email and you get the, the basic panel for free. And I believe that's on goodlight.us. That is correct. Uh, yep. Austin is correct. 
All right, thank you everybody. I'm gonna end the webinar. I'll take the recording of this. I'll put it on and I'll send it to everybody and remind everybody to hopefully attend some of our classes on uh, right after Thanksgiving. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you, Jay. Bye.